now plugged in to the Delphi Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Tommy and welcome back to the Delphi Podcast. Absolutely thrilled to have Ala on, who is the co-founder of BitTensor, one of the most well-known AI projects in crypto. We've had a lot of AI guests on. A couple of months ago, we did a series, so I'm glad to uh, to continue some of that coverage with this episode. Ala, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. So we're recording this on Monday, November 20th, and we're just coming off the hinges of the open AI drama where Sam Altman was sort of pushed out by a board with, you know, no or limited skin in the game at all. And 500 employees <laughs> are threatening to leave. Microsoft is, you know, Satya is trying to poach him. Before we even dive into the episode, I need your views on this one. What do you think's going on? It's very interesting how it's going, right? Because um, I think Satya did poach him, him and a few other folks from uh, open AI. So sort of kind of almost like making it official that they're no longer just an arm of Microsoft. They are part of Microsoft. And uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's sort of a, been a really funny weekend in that sense. It is wild, right? Just one of the largest and most successful AI companies sort of in history, right? I think the valuations were around 100 billion recently. And like they're dealing with this sort of just power struggle. And in all of our minds is like, how is the governance of AI going to work at scale? And this is kind of a... a Pretty bad example, right? Of how how things could play out. It's, yeah, exactly. It's a tad scary when you think about it, right? Because what OpenAI has really uh, done so far is they've sort of uh, kickstarted this this not only kickstarted six out of race, but more like they've started off this um, initiative, right? It's kind of hey, let's create the best model. Let's kind of all beat each other within the centralized players themselves. But their power struggle would be pretty catastrophic had they come up with something, let's say, like artificial general intelligence, right? Where like Literally, there. I'm not sure if we got to read the leaked uh, board bylaws, but literally, their board says if AGI was created, they get to decide how it's being used. And it's like a select group of people of like what seven or eight individuals. And it's it's very very scary stuff. Do you think a board, even of the board of OpenAI, is really in a position to dictate how artificial general intelligence should be released to the wild? I don't think they are. No. I, I think that they, they obviously have a lot of very talented people on there. They have a lot of very knowledgeable people on there. But something as massive and as close to the human condition as artificial general intelligence should not be dictated by a number of people that I can count on two hands. Let's get back into this. Let's uh, let's zoom back out to you first. Tell us a little bit about yourself so we know who we're talking to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Ala. I am, as you mentioned, co-founder of the OpenTensor Foundation. I obtained my PhD in applied AI in 2017. Um, it's interesting enough, I actually focused on applying AI to human body signals, much less so than sugared AI. Um, so basically, a lot of uh, my dissertation was determining what humans are doing and what the human condition is by detecting signals like electricity, heat, and even movement. So for example, detecting voltage generated from muscle contractions using sensors placed on the human skin. This involved a lot of work. It's basically an end-to-end -end product, which actually, funny enough, is one of the best things I got from my PhD is learning how to create end-to-end -end products. Since I really had to design the circuit boards, the sensors, write the firmware, and even write the AI models on top, which actually had to be super lightweight. And um, actually, they were classic AI models, not really exactly neural networks, since compute and performance were a big issue on these tiny, tiny circuits. After graduating, I decided to kind of move to Silicon Valley, try my hand at corporate research, and landed at VMware, working on distributed uh, compute. This is a pretty big difference because uh, I started some working on the somewhat early stage of predictive language models and predictive LSTMs. These are basically the old four Thunderbirds of AI now. Pretty to look at, but really completely outdated. And um, I also worked on some neural architecture search there. And really, we had some limited success with it, but it was enough to actually launch a few internal products and patent a few things as well. Afterwards, I just moved back to Toronto and uh, I met Jacob online. He's my co-founder at uh, the OpenTensor Foundation at an online not-for-profit collaboration called 4AI, which was founded by Aiden Gomez. He's also the founder of Cohere AI. And uh, he introduced me to Jacob, actually. And basically, I had just given a talk about what a distributed approach to machine learning could look like. And then Jacob basically approached me and he was like, cool talk, bro. I'm like five years ahead of you. Just come work with me. And uh, um, that's how I ended up uh, co-founding the foundation. It's pretty cool. What was your like crowning achievement with the medical side of things? Was was there anything that you kind of realized doing that work that, that shocked you or kind of blew you away? Uh, yeah, actually. Humans are very, very noisy objects. <laughs> that's one thing I learned. The funny thing is, um, one of the things that I was trying to do is an experiment in detecting finger movements using sensors placed on the skin, right? Now, the interesting thing is that finger movements are kind of like a pulley system. They're, they're, they're pulled by tendons. It's not like 
an actual muscle pulling the finger. It's pulling tendon that's pulling the finger. And so detecting that muscle's movement on top of people moving their hands and fingers and stuff is extremely noisy. And it took a lot of work to actually clean the data in the first place before it can be even inputted into a machine learning uh, model in itself. So um, yeah, I think the biggest, most interesting bit is that um, really learning just how dirty data can be. And just the word data by itself is just a giant umbrella. And what really matters is the distilled data coming out of it. And what really ultimately matters, which is what really is tied to our thesis at BitTensor, is the output of these models. That's the most important thing of everything. It's pretty wild. I mean, there's definitely some interesting comparisons there. I'm, I'm assuming what I get out of my whoop and what you were looking at on the medical side are two very different forms of, of data analysis. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. So at the time, there was um, the state of the art in that sort of data was the Mayo armband. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It made a big splash on the internet when it came out because people were basically turning on Netflix, pausing Netflix, uh, doing everything with their hand gestures. But it turned out to be actually very, very bad because it didn't sample fast enough to detect the muscle movements. If I recall correctly, of sampling at, I think it was 250 uh, megahertz and muscles were firing at like 1500, like more than uh, quadruple that. So it was missing a lot of the signals. And so um, it really kind of showed that when you build these products, a lot of it really doesn't quite work. A lot of it's kind of a little bit of uh, software magic. Yeah. No, measuring the wrong thing is, is pretty painful. So let's dive into to BitTensor. I have so many questions. I want to get back to our open AI that like we kind of opened with, but let's just hear the the BitTensor elevator pitch from you and let's go from there. Yeah. So to really kind of give you an overview, BitTensor is a lot like a graph. You really have two different acting um, entities. You have your validators and you have your miners, right? Now the validators are not really the blockchain validators that I think a lot of people are used to hearing. They're actually machine learning validators. And what they really do is they validate and ensure that the production, the, the outputs of the miners are coming from real AI models. Now, the miners on the other side are actually artificial intelligence models being run by people, entities, really anybody who's interested in, in trying to compete for Tao at that time. Now, the other's other job is actually also being a uh, front-facing entity to the system, right? So people... You can't really just ping every single uh, miner on the system and get back an output from the models. You actually have to go through the validators and the validators themselves actually give you back the best output from the system. So to give you a bit of a, um, a grounding example is if you're using OpenAI, you're speaking to ChatGPT, which is a very smart person. When you're using BitTensor, you're actually speaking to a room of smart people and you're getting the best response from the smartest person in the room. And that's sort of the approach that we're taking here. One of the biggest you know, uh, upgrades I think everyone's very excited about is subnets on BitTensor, right? Which really enables you to literally carve out a piece of the network to an idea or project that you have in mind. So that basically enables us to actually deploy models and to um, enable multimodality and kind of enable us to get away from the monolithic approach of like, let's say, okay, BitTensor from the founding day up until the subnets release was really just text models and that's it. Now you can have actually with subnets, you can actually have predictive models. You can have um, image uh, generation, you can have pre-training, you can have uh, even prime number generation, interestingly enough. So you can really do everything. And BitTensor is sort of becoming this one-stop shop for AI, where really we're trying to abstract away the blockchain side of these complications and just keep it as open as possible, even from a open source perspective and for a developer perspective as well, where people can just basically use the system in uh, a straightforward way as possible. We're trying to really disrupt without interrupting here. It's pretty cool. So just to make sure I understand the supply side well, so those that have powerful or smart or unique AI models sort of come to BitTensor and they allow, I guess, other people to run these models. And then when users come and they want to use the network for, for some reason, which we'll get into, they are then pinging like these models and then the model creator earns an incentive. In a sense, yeah. So what you're really doing is you're deploying a model in the shape of miner and the model just basically is ready for or prompts coming in from the other side. Now, what happens is these validators will prompt the models and they'll say, okay, what is the capital of Texas? Or even something more complicated, let's say, how do covalent bonds form? And the models will basically all respond back. And the one that passes the validator's tests, which is basically a stack of reward models, the one that actually is able to give back the best response, that model is rewarded. And the others are basically rewarded a little bit less for their responses. And effectively, the ranking is achieved in this way. You're really trying to get ranked higher than your peers. It's interesting. So I guess I don't know enough about OpenAI or Google's BART or things like that, but my assumption was always that those models that, that we all kind of know and love is just sort of one 
big model. And and on BitTensor, there are you know potentially hundreds or or thousands of models. Is that the right way to think about it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. I look at it. It's, it's it could be really any number of models you're talking to, but you're getting back the best response out of all of those. It's sort of we're we're sort of trying to get uh, the purest form of knowledge that you're seeking. It's pretty cool. It's crazy how history rhymes, right? Like in crypto, we've been debating, you know, this app chain versus modular thesis, or sorry, the monolithic versus app chain thesis forever. And meanwhile, it seems like it's rhyming here where you have, you know, dozens or hundreds of models versus centralized counterparts that have, you know, call it one main model. Yeah, it's a very good point. Like, are there that many people providing models to this? Like, I always assumed there was like a couple of gigabrains that had like, you know, a God tier model, but are there that many people that can provide differentiated models for different use cases? So that's the kind of a hard question to answer because we don't have visibility onto the other side, right? It could be maybe one person that has basically, you know, um, recycled, registered into the network quite a few times and released say 10 models, but they're all performing very well. Or it could be uh, 10 people, or it could be any number of, of users on the other side. What we really truly, um, care about is the outputs of these models, right? So one of the things that the validators do as well is they prevent people from spamming the network. So for example, what's stopping me from deploying, I don't know, let's say 10 chat GPT endpoints on the network and trying to basically get back the best response for all the models that I own, right? And that's sort of where the validators come in. That's where they ensure that, okay, the response has to be varied. It has to be uh, of a very specific, a very specific output that we're looking for. And it should be of a very um, specific structure that we're also looking for. So basically identical responses get penalized, for example. To basically answer your question more simply, to the extent of how many people are on the network, we don't really have a real number, but we do have a number for the demand, which is basically represented by the amount of people who are recycling Tau to actually get in, which is uh, quite high at this point, depending on the subnet. That's interesting. So let's uh, let's run with that. Let's assume that there are you know enough people out there to create differentiated models, provide them to the network uh, to be used. What is your worldview on why a multi-model AI project would beat a centralized model that has, you know, let's call it one model, like an open AI. And I assume they have one model. I'm not actually sure, but, you know, let's just assume that's the case. Yeah. So OpenAI actually does have different models that they run, but they're all different flavors of ChatGPT in a sense. What they're really doing is if your question is simple, it doesn't get sent to the massive model. There's no point. It costs them too much to do. So it's going to a simpler one, a smaller one that is still has similar capabilities. And so to answer the other question is why use many when you can really use only one? But the really interesting sense here is that if you used, say, one model over and over, let's say we, we decide, hey, you know what, let's let's just hang the towel, let's give it all to ChatGPT, and let ChatGPT handle everything. Now, the problem with that is you're sort of losing generalization. You're losing generalization, right? What's happening is ChatGPT is going to answer you in the way that OpenAI has trained it. It's not going to answer you in any different way. So you're really um, succumbing to the whims of the OpenAI engineers and the OpenAI data scientists who have trained the model in a very certain way. And as humans, we are all prone to bias. And that's just the human condition. That's how we are. We are all wired this way. I'm biased, you're biased, everyone's biased. Now, what you're doing is you're, you're sort of centralizing all of this bias and all of these uh, all of these issues into one place where it's going to be completely exacerbated. But if you take, for example, a system like BitTensor, right? Many models are existing and many of them have biases. And what happens instead is we are sort of encouraging people to speak to all of these models. You can actually ping the network and get back every single response and pick for yourself, right? You don't have to constrain yourself to one model trained by a very specific entity and be done. So in, in a perfect world, to be honest with you, is to have the Googles and the Betas and the uh, and the uh, the open AIs of the world participating on BitTensor and provide their power, provide their models on top. This is only going to make the entire collective much stronger and give you a more generalized response and in a sense sort of reduce the amount of um, variability in the response as well. So sort of give you more more of what you're looking for in, in an answer that is not controlled by a single entity. So I, when I went down my AI rabbit hole, I'm sure this was barely scratching the surface here, but my broad stroke was that something like OpenAI has tons and tons of parameters all between zero and one. And it's sort of generalized based on you know, kind of what you're saying. Like it's a one size fits all model that will never be overly specific to a to a certain use case. And that's sort of where I think BitTensor would come in. Yes, exactly. It would be because to give you a bit more of an example, actually, um, let's say that you asked uh, ChatGPT a very, very specific question about biology, right? You're always going to get a very general response. You're not going to get something that is as, <laughs> excuse me, that is as specific as a biology textbook, for example, or that is even deeper into like, for example, a biology paper. But what's stopping somebody from creating a subnetwork on BitTensor specifically for biological content, biological academic content? You can get a much better response there, right? Because that is specifically geared towards your question in a sense. So let's take that to the, the next step, right? Like if you're on the BitTensor network, 
and you ask that biology question and two different actors, one runs it through ChatGPT, one runs it through a biology LLM that they've you know tweaked and fine-tuned, yada, yada, and they, they provide a more specific answer. How do you know it's a more specific answer? Like, How do the validators decide like what the user gets back? Right. So the validators themselves are, this is actually a continuously evolving problem the world was dealing with, but the validators are actually deciding on what is the best answer depending on the stack of reward models that is within them. Now, um, I don't think we have time to delve into all the all the specifics, but really what these do is they sort of, in a way, act as filters. At the same time, they also, in a way, act as incentivizers to give people a response that is as uh, specific to the prompt as possible. So question, let's say that is, let's say, you know, well, how does cellular regeneration work? Really, really complicated question, preloaded. If you get back a really generic response to the question where something gives a very specific nuanced answer, the score of that nuanced answer is going to be higher than the one that is generalized. So that's more likely to get back to the user than the generalized one. That's awesome. Now, of course, this is oversimplifying a lot, but that is the gist of it. Yeah. So I guess, I guess as long as your reward functions like do what they say they do, you kind of, and again, I don't, I don't really know how that works much, but I think that's sort of the, the crux of not a marketplace, but the coordination games at play. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's where the game theoretic parts come in and that's where it gets fun, really. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. So we're talking a lot about the supply side. Let's switch to the, the demand side here. I think most people are sort of like up to speed on, on entering text into ChatGPT or Google's Bard or Claude or what have you. How do you exactly use um, BitTensor as a user? So as a user, you can really approach it from different ways. Now, um, if you recall earlier, I had mentioned that validators act as front-facing entities. Right now, these front-facing entities also are their entire job is really to um, be front-facing to the internet, to the world, and they need to provide APIs to the subnetworks that they're validating on. So, for example, let's say I've tried I've tried to create a validator, and this validator is actually running on let's say the image generation subnet. Right, it just helps generate images. Now, somebody trying to generate an image has to use my validator or any other validator that's providing an API to actually access the system. Now. The reason why it's designed this way, the reason why BitTensor is designed this way is because it's designed to be a tool for people to build stuff on top of. It's sort of like building a mall and it's up to everyone else to build the shops inside the mall. Now, if somebody wants to interact with the mall itself, they have to go through the shop, which is basically your validator. And so let's say, for example, I am a person who's trying to build an image generation website. And so all the website really needs to do is just plug into the API of the validator and ping that validator with whatever prompts that the users are sending. I think the simplest example would be, uh, I think Tao.studio already does this exactly right, but I think that's down. So maybe Bit API is the next one. Got it. Okay. So it's kind of like choose your own adventure on how you want to access the network. In a sense, it's it's in a sense choose your own adventure, but it's also up to you in the sense of which valid validator you pick, right? It's not just any validator. You want to pick a validator that is involved in the network, a validator that has priority in the network. So meaning if it has a higher stake, it has a higher priority. At the same time, a validator that is in also within your ideals as well. So for example, let's say there's a validator that is, for lack of a better example, is validating uh, on an image subnetwork, which is just generic, generic images, and they're validating on a subnetwork that, uh, for example, I have concerns with. Let's say they're validating on an image subnetwork that allows for not safe for work images. That's not a thing I'm a fan of. So maybe I'm not going to pick this validator. I'm going to pick a different one that only validates on image subnetworks. So we're really letting the markets decide on everything. It's not just, you know, arbitrarily choose. Okay, I understand. So the validators are taking on, I guess, much more of a consumer or front-facing role than traditionally how I think of, of validators and crypto networks. Right. You should look at it. These validators are not the blockchain validators. We do have blockchain validators, but they're very, they're really on the blockchain side of things. There's no, there's no real, there's no real uh, access or innovation to them aside from actually validating the things that we're doing in our transactions. The real magic is in the machine learning validators, which are really validating the, the intelligence coming out of the networks. Interesting. Okay. I think one thing that would help drive home is, is sort of like the whole follow the money routine, right? So like of the tau that's emitted, what is the breakdown there? Like wh where is that going from a stakeholder perspective? That's a great question. And that's going to be a fun one to explain without a <laughs> without a whiteboard. So for those listening, actually, we are, we are revamping all of our docs. We really were expecting all of this uh, demand to come in all at once. So our documentation is still a tad lacking. So the updates are coming, I promise. There's a tau emitted every 12 seconds. Right. So, so let's zoom in on that 12 seconds. Now, each subnetwork has its own emission percentage. So this is set by validators on subnetwork zero. Subnetwork zero is a static subnetwork where all basically the validators for the subnetworks will reside. And they get to decide, okay, I want, let's say the image subnetwork, I care about a lot. So I'm going to dump 50% of all tau that I'm getting should be going to that subnetwork basically. So 
in a very simplified example, let's say that 50% of all time emitted is going to subnetwork two. Now, 18% of that 50% is going to the owner of the subnetwork, and the remaining 82% are split 50 50 between the validators and the miners on the subnetwork. Got it. And what's the difference between a validator and a miner again? Yeah, validators uh, really is kind of like mining on auto mode. Uh, they really just ensure the network remains honest and they validate the output of the miners. The miners provide the output depending on prompts coming from the validators. So they're sort of providing the supply side of things. Okay, got it. Well, one thing I'm confused on is just dictating that that flow of tau in step one. So if you're on the subnetwork zero, are you deciding the flow based on how much tau you have staked or or was that something different? Yeah, basically your stake determines just how much of a say you have and what subnetwork should get how much weight. Okay, got so it. So say, those with the most skin in yeah. the game decide the rewards for the most useful exactly. subnetworks. So you could, I mean, if I'm a large tau holder, I could potentially flow tau to a subnetwork that doesn't even exist yet, right? For a use case that I may deem valuable? Not quite. Now, because you're a large, let's say you are a large tau holder, um, you might want to try to move tau towards some network that belongs to you or some network that you really care about. If you deviate too much from the other validators, you fall, you risk falling out of consensus. And so if you fall out of consensus, then you risk losing your rewards yourself, right? Now, let's say that you know, you have your large tau holder, but all the other validators don't agree with you. They, they think it should be elsewhere. That means that your say in that subnetwork will not be much because them collectively still more than you by yourself, in a sense. So there's a bit of a majority rules sort of thing going on as well. Okay, that makes sense. So you could sort of, you could allocate rewards sort of how you'd like and to your benefit, but if you fall out of some general consensus measure, you risk losing what you have staked. Sort of, yeah. So, so to kind of be more clear, it's that you can delegate how you, uh, sorry, you can uh, set weights is what we call it to um, each summer. You can set weights how you wish. There's nothing wrong with that. However, that is still influenced by the others as well. If they don't agree with you, then you won't get as much weights as you expect, as much emission as a result. And if you do that too far, if you go too far with it, then that's when you kind of lose emissions. Okay, that's pretty helpful. So what is the second order effect of like letting token holders dictate these subnetworks? Like, are you hoping that there's more incentives for models for a certain subnetwork like image generation or text generation or audio transcription? Or is the idea, yeah, well, walk me through that thinking a little bit. The idea really here is that we want ultimately, you know, the, the reason we started all of all of BitTensor is we want to tie the value of tau to the value of AI, right? And that's why there was no pre-mine, there was no uh there was no say ICO or anything like that. Every tau created as a tau that was been mined fairly. And as a result of that, we want to keep the incentives within the market. We want to let the market drive the incentives more than anything. Because you know, we're strong believers in markets. We believe the best way to decentralize AI is using markets. And so we don't really have a specific goal towards, okay, we want to do this subnetwork or that subnetwork. We just want to let the, the market decide. We want the network, the community decide, okay, we care more about this than that, and so on. And in a way, it sort of becomes self-regulated. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like who dictates the most important models or subnetworks here, right? Like, is it the consumer with their needs or is it kind of the token holders staking to a specific subnetwork? I, th I think you know where I'm going with this. It's it's sort of like a, a little bit of a give and a take. It is. It is. It's sort of like a, in a sense, it's I look like a, it's a balancing act, right? So let's say that a validator decides to dictate, okay, I don't care about this, this, this subnetwork, right? But his delegators, right? So the people who delegate their tau to that validator and say, okay, I'm giving you, you know, I'm letting you stake my tau in return for a reward. If you basically validate the way that I ask you to, you kind of risk going out of consensus with them too. If I don't like a way that a validator is doing, I'm just going to move to another one that more aligns with my values, right? So it's a bit of a, a balancing act between the validators, between their own delegators, and between the miners themselves and what they're doing on that subnetwork. Yeah, this is a good segue into like why do decentralized AI, right? And and versus centralized, just like the level of transparency you have. So I want to give you like a maybe like a bit of a prompt, you know, no pun intended. But so Jan LeCun is the chief AI strategist at Meta. He's a professor at NYU. And he tweeted that like on one hand, we have Mistral, Aleph, Hugging Face, Meta, IBM, and sort of the entire startup ecosystem yearning for open source foundational models. And then like Google, AI, Anthropic arguing the opposite. Like we need regulation, we need a regulatory moat, yada, yada. Obviously you're in the, the former camp, but I mean, just walk us through a bit of why, because you just gave us like how transparent the network is, but now I kind of sort of want to get into, 
you know, why why exactly you feel so strongly about doing it this way? Mm-hmm. This is a very good question. And I think uh, it's it delves into a lot of parts. Let's start first with centralized AI. Centralized AI has been around since the beginning of AI, since the, since heck, since the 1960s, when the first AI, like um, when the first equations that inspired AI came out, really, the, the neurons. AI models were always these monolithic pieces of code that existed on one computer, took an input, produced an output, and that's it. And because of the massive amounts of data and compute required, this sort of naturally centralized them even more to those entities that could afford them, like Google, Meta, Netflix, and so on. There's nothing really technically or ethically wrong with having a model on one computer. In fact, it's actually the most efficient way to do it. And that's why, you know, even in the BitTest network, we don't shatter models around. We don't really like shard them into different computers. Every miner has its own model and it's entirely encased within that miner. But if history has shown us anything from the East from the East India Trading Company and its involvement with opium wars and slavery all the way up to modern day tech companies, is that with centralized AI, and really when we're speaking here, we're talking about these giant corporations, money is always the bottom line. What makes us the most money? Let's pursue that. And ethics are sort of often thrown to the wayside because of it. And it's naive of us to assume these companies are always going to be ethical about it. AI is actually really interesting in the sense compared to everything else that's been centralized because it's so it encompasses so much of the human condition in it. Everything from bias to ethics to racism to socialism and even philosophy. So it can't and should not ethically be controlled by a single corporation or entity. It's kind of like having the entire internet controlled by a single corporation, which is something that Microsoft attempted to do back in 1995 by trying to monopolize Internet Explorer by regulation. Thankfully, they failed. But now we have, for example, this infamous leaked memo from Google that they don't have the moats. They don't have a moat because open source AI is quickly catching up to these other companies that are advocating for open source AI and because of the open source movement. This regulatory moat they're creating is sort of fixing the problem by going to the teacher instead of trying to figure it out and play like the other kids. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, no, it definitely does. I'm I get like caught up on this a little bit because I'm worried that if we keep having like centralized companies in our government arguing over what's allowed, what's not allowed, I feel like we're just going to have a competing country sort of win, right? Like if, if we're so busy trying to regulate things versus building them, you know, does that set us back from a like geopolitical standpoint? And then obviously you have crypto, which is, yeah, and then crypto is just open source on, on the other side. Like, what, what do you think? Honestly, this is sort of, living in Canada, I'm not sure if you were aware of the situation here, but, um, and I'm probably going to get assassinated at some point for saying this, but it's already happened in Canada, right? Um, the the three telecoms companies, Rogers, Talus, and Bell, they own everything, right? They regulated the hell out of it so that there is no real way for anyone to compete with them anymore. So now what you have is Canadians getting the really the last of everything. We are lagging behind on, on all our uh, telecom technology. Everyone's being charged exuberant amounts on their bills, and there's nothing being done about it. And I'm not sure if you heard about it, but last year in July, I think, there was an outage, and it knocked 25% of the country offline, including unknown services, because one of the providers did not basically messed up. And that's just telecom. I cannot, I, I'm scared to imagine what happened if this happened with AI. That's crazy. Let's walk down this path a little bit. Like, let's say that OpenAI... Anthropic, whomever, uh, get favorable regulation for their business, right? For by some stroke of the pen. What exactly are you most afraid of? Are you afraid that like there'll be this shadowy AI controlling all our daily lives? Are you afraid of terminators? Like, w- what exactly is it that you're you're very afraid of in, in that scenario? I think I'm less afraid of terminators and more afraid of how it's going to affect our daily lives, right? So, so like this. AI today already affects our daily lives, right? Everything from the Google Chrome that you use, that I'm using right now, to talk to you on this podcast, all the way to my phone. There's there's AI models everywhere. And these are created by different people, right? Like I have an iPhone, this AI model running on it, it's done by Apple, Google Chrome created by Google and so on. But if it gets regulated and there's no way to compete with these people, it's going to affect us financially. It's going to affect us socially. It's going to affect us even mentally, right? Because they get to target everything at us. At, at our expense, basically. We, we become the fuel to power their AI. Our data becomes the fuel to power their AI. Our our daily lives become the fuel to power their AI. And, you know, honestly, um, I don't know, call me rebel, but I'm not, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm not planning to do that with my life. And that's, I don't think it's any, something anybody wants, right? And it's a problem that open source AI in itself solves. Yeah. So how exactly does open source AI, I guess, solve like this, the age old um, alignment issue, right? Like, and, you know, just to paraphrase here, this issue is that, you know, a couple of people in a room, you know, put their views into something and, and it affects the model for everyone, right? Like, how would something like a bit tensor buck the trend there? Yeah. So it's it's sort of, let's look at the transformer model, right? Um, if anybody's not aware, transformer models are basically sort of foundational models 
that uh, have been used in everything nowadays, um, in every sort of aspect of science, and they kind of uh, more famously used in the GPTs, right? They're generative uh, transformers, really. And this is what they power, the power of GPTs. So there's open source transformers, and there's the chat GPT aspect, right? Your open source transformers were just by Huggy Face a while ago. And um, I actually name five academic papers just off the top of my head that have been released and made possible because of this open source transformer that was released by Hugging Face. They encompass everything from astronomy to bi uh, biology, protein folding to uh, geology, and all the way up to climate change as well. And these weren't were not going to be possible because these researchers probably couldn't afford, or their grants didn't allow them to use things like ChatGPT. They had to use an open source transformer. If you go and you take this away, and you just make it so that's only you can only pay for it, basically, then really you're not just limiting the AI researchers to basically be the ones that are at the richest institutions to be successful. You're also limiting the rest of science. All of science might actually suffer because of this, because a lot of people are starting to use AI nowadays, but they might not have the budget, but they still have some good solid research. Why, why are they paying for it when they can have it for free using open source? Now, open source in itself, right? It sort of allows you to, well, it allows everybody to view the code that was written, to view the data that was, that was trained on. So you can sort of get more eyes on it. You can sort of eliminate things like bias. You can eliminate things like, enable things like transparency, right? And really what you're doing is you're sort of creating this AI that is more generalized than specific, right? In the interest of the dollar, really, the almighty the almighty dollar, Google and Meta have created some really scary stuff, right? Uh, like for example, Google's AI at some point classified people of color as monkeys. That's a terrifying thought. Imagine a racist Terminator, like, no. It's it's a really crazy thing to think about, right? And and this is honestly it's it's a down it's a downward trend, and it's uh, literally a, all downhill from there. That's a great take. I mean, one of the things that I worry about is that you know the majority of people are just going to go to the best service, right? Like a Google or or, or whatever, right? I'm sure you disagree with that long term, right? For VidTensor, but a, a lot of people will will generally flock to like the largest, easiest thing to use, and. I think the thing that scares me is that we really don't realize the bias at play, right? Like, how do we actually know this thing is biased at scale? Like, how do we know it's telling people one thing and maybe something that's more extreme? There's there's only, you know, handfuls of people that can audit these models, and that's even if they have access, right? So, like, I feel like we're, we're never really going to get a great solution here. Do you? I think you can, and that's sort of where, uh, you know, incentivized audits come in. That's sort of where incentivized compute comes in, right? Um, so take, for example, the, the President Biden's executive order, executive order, right? They were saying basically they wanted to audit all the models that are being trained and they wanted to make sure that everything is ship shape before they release it and yada, yada. Who's auditing this? I, I really don't think it's going to be, you know, PhD AI people auditing this. It's probably going to be, you know, a few, you know, admin folks who have a limited knowledge or some regular training on this. And they're just told to look for certain specific things. And they're not really taught to kind of look outside because they don't really know what to look for. They have a lot of unknown unknowns, right? But in a system like, say, BitTensor, right? Or, you know, it's, again, it's kind of tooting our own horn here, but just to kind of give you an example. Let's say that you've got a subnetwork that starts getting biased, right? In very subtle ways. What's going to happen is because of all the people using it, because of all the supply side of things, because of all the validators on the system, there's a lot of checks and balances that prevent this from happening. And they're all open. They're all transparent and they're all allow everyone to take a look and look under the hood and say, okay, this looks funny. This doesn't look good. Even the validators on OpenTensor itself, if you take a look at our code, our validators open. You can actually literally look through the code and see what models are using. And those models themselves are released on Hugging Face as well. So in this sense, you're sort of creating a system where everyone has eyes on it to the sense that you can, we'll never really truly really eliminate bias, but we can reduce it to a great extent, right? And that's just because that's just how we are as humans. There's no single unbiased human on the planet. But essentially, if you reduce it to a, to a great extent, because we're all working together on it, that's the closest we're going to get. And we're going to get pretty damn close to reducing it if the system works the way that we are aiming for it to work. No, that's that's a really helpful response. I, I guess like the the question for the next couple of years is like, do you ever think an open AI will go fully transparent, right? Because that would move them much closer to you know your bucket, right? Obviously not not too close, but you know somewhat close. Honestly, in a perfect world, you know, this is like bucket list a la close to Christmas, Santa, if you're listening sort of thing, a open AI will go fully transparent and just deploy in BitTensor. There's nothing wrong with that. We'd love that. Like we don't see these folks as as competition. We see them as potential people who can build on the system and make it even better. 
So we want to win them over, right? We don't, we don't want to like, we want to show them the way, basically. We want to show them the light. And if OpenAI goes full transparent and everything's fully open, they're going to need some sort of funding mechanism, obviously. Either they're funded through Microsoft or they're funded in some other way. If they decide to sort of compete on the system and build models that are able to learn and become better just by sheer virtue, really, of being on BitTensor, then really that's a self-reinforced mechanism, right? They're earning and at the same time, they're also deploying models that are helpful to everyone else. So I'll push back and I'm probably at the the end of my AI knowledge here, but just thinking through the econ, I'm curious your take. Like if OpenAI were to go fully transparent with their model, right? And, you know, people tweak it for various use cases and they provide it to BitTensor, that's phenomenal, right? You have like this God tier model and you have, maybe not God tier, but leading model and, you know, fine tuned for all these different use cases. But I guess the problem is like for OpenAI's calculus, like they're not capturing a lot of this value, right? Because the models are being run by other people on their devices and they're earning tau, you know, yada, yada, mints of fees. Like, why do you think the OpenAI team would decide to do that? Or, or am I totally off here? No, you're not totally off. I think it, it's a very fair question. And I think it's actually a tad naive of me to be like, you know, this is OpenAI is going to spike the bullet and that's what they're going to do. At the end of the day, of course, their bottom line is also to earn money and to make, you know, make, make some sort of income. And and that's sort of where the beauty of Web3 comes in, right? That's where the sort of beauty of, of blockchain comes in. They can totally release the models, but they can also be competitive and keep some stuff to themselves to try to contribute to the system, right? There's nothing stopping for these miners who are existing on the system from just close sourcing the model and competing with it, right? The output is still visible, but we don't see what it's built on. And that's sort of one of the hardest problems of BitTensor, but that's not a bad thing, right? All it means is just that these people want to keep their cards close to their chest and that's perfectly fine. And if their model is sort of starting to deviate or starting to do something funny, then the validators will detect that. That's what the, what's the whole point why there's validators in the first place. That's pretty cool. No, that's that's helpful. So, Al, let's go into some of the fun stuff. Like, what do you think, like, what are you most excited for that's being built on BitTensor? Like, is it a specific sub-network or is it like we're something else? It's honestly, it's everything. It's It's been so overwhelming lately. There's so many crazy, uh, cool projects that are running, right? Like, um, Jacob, my co-founder, he's actually building a free training sub-network. So that means you could train a model from scratch there and not just deploy an inference model or something. Uh, there's somebody doing music generation, which I think is going to sound so crazy wacky. It's going to be awesome. Um, and another one is uh, actually Robert. We actually uh, was with us uh, for a while, and then he kind of left us to create his own sub-network. It's vector search. And honestly, I'm starting, you know, James and I are starting to use it more often than GPT-4 in the first place. And it's already you know, available on beta. You can actually play with it right now. So it's 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 crazy cool how fast these technologies are moving when we decentralize a little bit more and we let the community build on their own. I think that's the most important part. I mean, it's one step removed, I guess, from the consumer's mental model, right? Because like you guys are running the sub-networks and then the UI or the apps that people would use, like call it image generation, that could be anything, right? That could just be some image generation website five, but when people enter a prompt, it sort of routes to BitTensor. So I guess like you can't even keep track of probably what's being built at the app side. It's probably a lot. <laughs> I don't, I, I honestly can't. Even subnet side, I'm having trouble keep track because we're not building them, right? It's just our community that's building it. We really only built the text prompting sub-network and I guess by extension, my co-founder's building is pre pre-training sub but that's it. There's like, I think, shoot, we extended it to 32 sub if I'm not mistaken. Maybe don't quote me on the number just because that, that's numbers changing. No, it's like, I'm on the website and, or uh, I'm on taustats.io and there's like, you know, sub-networks 19 through 27 are like unknown, like as in TBD, like, so I'm excited to see what those will, mm -hmm. uh, those will become. It's, I think it's going to be most fun when we cap it and there's no more room for sub-networks and people still want to build more. That's going to be fun. So within a sub-network though, like text prompting, like sure, that's one sub-network, but you could have 10,000 models on there. It's completely up to us to what we would find, how many, how many models we want in there. It could be anything. For now though, just to kind of keep you, um, kind of ground the idea a little bit, uh, we are capping a tad on the amount of uh, total people who are on the network just because we want to make sure that our blockchain can actually sustain all this activity. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. You could progressively scale as as you kind of go. That's exactly how we're going, yeah. I guess like my surface level concerns, I'd, I'd love for you to dispel. Like the first one was on, you know, who has the best models, a centralized player versus decentralized. And, and we kind of chatted through the many model versus, versus one model for specification side. The other question I have for you though, is just on the hardware itself. Like it's always been my understanding that these large tech companies are the ones that have the lock on buying the NVIDIA H100s, like the best mining equipment. And it would never be on, you know, say my laptop or phone to provide hardware that would train models to, to that degree, right? What is your take there? Like, do you care? Does BitTensor not care? Or what type of hardware limitations or, or benefits do you have versus those players? Um, okay. They do have lots of access. Yes. That is not something anybody can can really um, refute. But this brings to mind Bitcoin. In 2013, uh, the Bitcoin network became actually the most, more powerful 
than the top 500 supercomputers in the world combined, which is just an insane number if you really think about it. We're talking petaflops of power, right? Even higher. And it really dwarfs any compute created by any corporation. It doesn't matter if they have H100s or anything else. And this was really accomplished by all the Bitcoin miners working together towards a single incentive, right? The inefficient part about decentralized players as well is that they're not only competing with the decentralized players like us, but they're also competing with each other in a really non-collaborative way, right? Like at the end of the day, Meta and Google, they're competing with each other. They're not competing with they're not really even looking at us quite yet in that light, but we are coming their way and they know this, hence the leaked document um, about them having no moat. So this makes it so that if the compute backing decentralized AI reaches Bitcoin level, then these centralized players will never have this advantage again. In fact, it actually would be more beneficial for them to just participate in the system and be done with it. So in a lot of ways, um, they do have a lot of power, but they have a lot of power individually. We have a lot of power collectively. And I think that's where our edge comes in. Yeah, that's helpful. I, do you think that it'll eventually, there'll be some specialization in the network or or maybe not specialization, but centralization of the network? Like, Do you envision like large groups buying mass amounts of hardware for certain use cases and entering the network or, or it's all the same? It's very possible, really. It depends on how the community and how the world's kind of whatever it's trending in, right? If the world trends towards, say, I don't know, um, auto-generated music, then yeah, maybe the music somebody becomes the biggest one because that's what people are trending towards. And that's kind of the best part about the subnetwork work itself, right? Let's say that for the next five years, we trended towards text and only text, which is actually what happened basically from 2018 all the way up to now, right? Which is like a period of about five years. Then maybe all of the resources and all the weights and everything and all the emissions would have gone to the text subnetworks, right? Any one of them. Maybe the next five years from 2023 all the way up to 2028, we're going to be focused more on images. So we can just literally tilt over and go over to the image subnetwork and all the resources will be pulled over there. So the nice thing about it is that it's very easy to switch context because of all the versatility of the system and of the tensor itself. And that's actually one of the edges that we have over a lot of other projects. Yeah, it is. I mean, going into this podcast, I sort of assumed that, you know, Google and Anthropic and OpenAI would be first to release the best upgrades. But I mean, with your network, anybody can release any model they want. So there's no like, six months delays or product meetings or, or anything. If somebody has a better model, they can just drop it. There's no ethical kind of debates going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the beauty of it. And that's actually one of the one of the biggest selling points about our system too, is that it's it's able to um, ingest any technology into it, right? Let's say, so uh, to give you another example, right now we are running um, on PyTorch, which is uh, one of the main toolkits to create uh, neural networks using the Python programming language. The other main toolkit is TensorFlow, which is developed by Google. Let's say a group of scientists come in and they're like, okay, we only know TensorFlow, we don't know PyTorch. So we're just gonna start creating subnetworks in, in uh, TensorFlow. And they can, they could totally do that and start just basically interfacing with it using TensorFlow on that subnetwork using the validators they've created. It's, it's super straightforward. And it, that's kind of the beauty of it too, is that we can literally ingest any technology coming in and any modality as well and turn it into something that can really flourish on the network given that it has the right incentive. Yeah, that is pretty that is pretty powerful. Just the the choice of, of building however or whatever language you'd want. I have a different question for you. Have you had conversations with these smart people at traditional tech companies about coming over to open tensor? Like I'm curious like why they would want to come. Like do they disagree with the you know the politics or the drama or the ethics or <laughs> do they want to make more money or do they want to experiment? Like, I'm curious how those conversations have been. Yeah, to be honest with you, you know, everyone on the Open Tester team is one of those guys. Um, everyone from Jacob, my co-founder, who is ex Google, all the way out to you know, uh, what like all the way out to like junior engineers. That's sort of the what kind of put us together is that we're all sort of not disenfranchised, we're sort of disillusioned with big tech and the way big tech is doing things. Sort of that's 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 the story that we are trying to approach the AI community with as well, because they're the people we want to bring on to create more supply side. Now the tricky part though is because we have a blockchain as uh, our incentive mechanism, it sort of carries with it some negative connotations, right? Because cryptos, let's be honest, we've had a few eggs in our faces. To do this the right way, we need to approach the AI community the right way, which is really through paper publications, through uh, scientific methods, and really showing them that what we built is numerically sound and is uh, from an experimental point of view correct and it is theoretically operational. We want to basically um, speak their language to, to, for lack of a better term, right? So one of the biggest AI conferences, Neural IPS, it's basically it's the Oscars of AI um, for those of you unaware. Uh, we basically, um, there has been a BitTensor engineer or that has been a, let's say we've had a BitTensor engineer or engineers that have been authors or co-authors on a paper in that conference for the last two years. And we intend on keeping up that streak 
and continuing publication to become more and more prominent as a research powerhouse in decentralized AI at the same time to kind of show the AI community that there is a way to use the blockchain as a utility correctly without, for lack of a better term, without the sleaze that people have experienced in the past. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like kind of naive here, right? Like I don't exact. I feel like there's a pretty big rift between the AI, San Fran crew and crypto, right? Sort of what you're alluding to. But obviously you and your co-founders come from Web2, right? You, you, you know what it's like um, and you still came over. What do you think though is like the center of gravity on pulling these folks in? Like, do you think it'll be, I don't know what the event would be, right? Like maybe OpenAI's alignment issues right now with their board is like a good example, right? But I mean, are those folks like OpenAI employees running to you or they, I feel like most of them right now are probably running to Microsoft kind of to follow Sam, but. Exactly. That's the exactly. And they're running to Microsoft to follow Sam and they're running to other maybe Web2 companies. But those are the type of people that we want to bring into the system, right? Those are the kind of people that we want to kind of yank in. These people who are disenfranchised with, uh, disincentivized, sorry, with the way that big tech does things, they're disillusioned with the way uh, the status quo. And we want those people to come to BitTensor. But these people won't come just because we, you know, we tag them on Twitter or because we have a LinkedIn job listing. We need to carry clout. We need to carry star power. We need to carry a name. And that's sort of what goes back to what I was saying in terms of publication stuff, because that's where all these people flock to. Every single one of those guys that went to Microsoft or that followed Sam, I guarantee you have either been either a uh, board member or has been a reviewer or attending Neural IPS for the last few years. So they're all there. And this is where we can basically um, stand out from everyone else and say, okay, come join us. You know, you're unhappy with the way big tech is doing things. We are also unhappy. Come join us, build your own AI model, and earn from that directly instead of increasing someone else's bottom line. And that's sort of the other way that we want to calculate as well. It's sort of, we're looking at, for example, creating an ecosystem fund where we can create grants and say, okay, come in, build something cool, build something interesting. And this is another way we can kind of um, incentivize these people to join us. And that's, um, we can fund you, but come build and even keep the tau if you want to, that you get from the system. Nice. Just to linger on this point a little more, I mean, if you're like a you know a rock star employee at, at the centralized co and you're I mean you're disenfranchised but you're making kind of so much money right and you're you're kind of thinking to yourself like you know if I'm struggling with this like the world would have you know issues you know governing AI it seems like kind of hard to get them over the hump right I feel like you need some sort of event that really disenfranchises the web 2 AI folks to make like a gravitational kind of shift over I'm not sure what that is it's, Maybe like some sort of misalignment issue or, or something goes wrong, but I'm not sure what it would be. I think it's more of a cascade of things that's going to go wrong. Um, it's not just... So as we've seen today, actually, the, with the, with, with, not today, actually, the last weekend, with Sam Altman and that whole thing, that's going to keep happening. That's not something that's just gonna, like a one and done. That's going to keep happening over and over and over. And that's because we keep putting a single person in power of everything else. And these people often fail us. Not to say anything bad about Sam or anything, I don't know the story, but just generally, that's just how the human human population is. And I think in a sense, I agree with you, there is some events that have to happen to actually get them down to us. But at the same time, I think before that, we need to establish ourselves as a serious player in the AI community, which is, which is something we are in the process of doing as we speak via the publications and via the conferences and everything. Once we get to that stage, that if that event happens or even in the absence of that event, it might be easier to pull these people in. Because I agree with you, they are very hard to pull in. And you know, frankly, as a person who was in academics for a long time, and I've worked with these people quite a bit, they can be very stubborn in the way that they view things. And it's sort of very hard to change their minds. And the only way to do so is to speak their language, which is really kind of showing them that we're a serious player in the system. No, that, that's totally fair. I mean, I'm not smart enough to like think through all the reasons why those devs would, would initially come over to experiment you know, on a weekend or something. But I mean, just you giving them the ability to deploy you know, some model that they're working on late at night or something, if that's a thing, and get like real user feedback at scale. I mean, that's got to be worth something. Yeah, exactly. We're sort of creating a benchmark here. And that's how they can benchmark their models, right? It depends on its performance on the system, how well is it doing? And again, like you said, it's an easy way for them to kind of burn back as well. Allah, switching gears a little bit, is there any other areas of crypto AI overlap that that interests you? Like, we have like the the obvious examples through like Akash and Jensen with, you know, using your latent hardware for inference and, and training. And, you know, there's abstracting away the complexity of crypto with LLMs and making the UI really easy. But are there any other areas, you know, potentially even outside BitTensor that, that you're interested in? Yeah, um, I'd be very curious to see somebody. I'm not sure if Jensen is still working on this. I remember hearing something about that from those guys. They're, they're brilliant, but I'm not entirely sure if they're still working on this. Federated learning using blockchain. 
Um, that is something that hasn't, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen yet. And that should be very interesting to do. It's also possible to do by subnet. Um, however, somebody tackling this, I think, might be onto something. Because to give you more of a concrete example, um, <coughs> do you, if you use Siri or Alexa or, um, heck, even, um, uh, what was Google's Google Assistant? It's actually technically a model that is sharded across different devices. And what you're really doing is you're using that same model that is geared towards you to do to, you know, day day things with it. The problem with this though is uh, verification, right? And security. How do I make sure this is, you know, my model, my data, my everything, right? And what you're really doing is you're sort of dumping it on Google or on Apple or whomever, and they're the ones who are kind of making sure that your data is secure and being used by that model correctly. But using a using a blockchain to actually verify all of that and ensuring that this uh, this model is actually belonging to you and that it actually is producing data that's relevant to you is a very interesting problem to me. Yeah, that is a good point. Like just proving that the model is doing what it says it's doing and not messing with you is is hard to solve. Mm-hmm. It's a very difficult problem. Yeah. yeah, it's and again, we kind of go back to that audit issue. If the user can't tell, then it gets even harder. I mean, I guess, is there any interplay with, you know, Tau itself doing auditing of other AI models to make sure that people are not getting biased results, to make sure that, you know, if they're using DeFi, they're not rugging your tokens, stuff like that? There is probably a way to do that. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought about it that much, but the way, did, the way that it would be done is if they deployed on the system in the first place, right? As, as a verification system. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. I'll, I have one question from a friend, Nima of C-Club BC. He's curious, like, if you expect consumer apps with hundreds of millions of users to sort of use BitTensor. So I guess like not use BitTensor, but use like the UIs or consumer facing applications that then leverage the BitTensor subnetworks. Like, I guess maybe a more specific question is like, what applications are you excited for at scale for people to use? Yeah, it's a very good question. And to be honest with you, the applications are still, as, as we discussed earlier, they're, they're still being built and there's still a lot of work being done on that end. But if you take, for example, let's say Subnet 1, right? Um, Subnet 1 is still a continuous work in progress. But seeing applications like uh, chatbots for technical support, right, which is being used literally every day nowadays, or we're seeing applications like texting messengers, right, for people who are you know, trying to speak with somebody, kind of hearing something back and stuff. Seeing this sort of thing deploy on top, I think that's probably one of the easiest ways to kind of get into the system and build something on top. But at the same time, you sort of were asking if these non-crypto app people, how would they be kind of trying to use the system in the first place with the uncertainty of Tau and all that. And sort of the beauty of it is goes back to the validators that I mentioned, these front-facing entities. Because the validator itself can have its very own uh, operating expenditures, but it can charge a very different price for your prompts that are coming in. And as a result, it actually more often than not might actually end up being cheaper than OpenAI in the first place. So these people would be, you know, most companies, most businesses would be interested in getting the, you know, the cheapest option that is satisfying to their business needs. And more often than not, that's going to be one of the subnets, just because the operating cost of OpenAI by themselves is much higher than a person operating subnet, right? So, for example, uh, subnet nine, which is the pre-training, sub- which is the pre-training subnet, has already reached GPT two levels of training. But OpenAI spent twelve million dollars an hour training to get up to GPT two, which is just a crazy amount. Yeah, that is wild. I mean, one thing I was thinking about on the side was just like you brought up a really good point about how the lo- the centralized models are just so generalized, like. If I wanted a model specific to my country or specific to my business or specific to my culture, like I don't think I'm really ever going to get that through a centralized player, which I guess is its own use case in and of itself. I guess like one thing just talking through use cases was just like if I wanted a model specific to my culture or country, I'm never going to get that through like an open AI, I don't think. Because if you have a country specific model, then all of the UIs you build out that touch that model, like image generation, text, questions, et cetera, would all be under the lens of that culture. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, exactly. And then I guess you could just ask them all at once and have them all meld together. Basically. One thing that people can actually do is, um, you know, let's say for, to give you a better example, I, I'm Middle Eastern, right? I'm from Iraq. So like, let's say that um, I have a subnetwork for Arabic models. Models only speak in the language Arabic and that's it. Now, Arabic has different dialects. In, in Iraq has a different dialect than Jordan, than Palestine, than, than Syria, than Saudi Arabia, than Egypt, and so on and so on and so on. And actually, the funny enough, the further west you move towards Morocco, the weirder it gets. And then same thing, they, they believe about us too. So basically something, a subnetwork that kind of is able to speak Arabic is very different from a subnet that can speak a very specific dialect of Arabic. But you can still run all of these models together in one subnetwork that speak all these different kinds of Arabic, as long as they have the same foundation bottom, which is the foundational Arabic itself, they'll run just fine. And this way, you sort of create a subnetwork that can actually be able to speak many dialects of the same language. 
And in a sense, that sort of decentralizes the dialects themselves. But you're also sort of incentivizing people to run these models to, uh, to sort of run, run these models with as many dialects as possible, in a sense. And that really applies to everything, not just the Arabic. It's just kind of a simple example here. That's pretty cool. So if I wanted to create, like, let's say, a, a model for every country's culture and put that on BitTensor, is this like a, you know, I take a foundational model and I sort of tweak it based on a bunch of data that I could gather from, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure, but, you know, from that country's, you know, the internet basis or? You could, but the, the thing is that there's a cap on the amount of culture you can, not on the amount of data you can fit into a model, right? There's like, there's, there's a, eventually you're going to run into a limit of how much you're going to um, fit into one small model, unless you want to grow it to be ChatGPT sized. So one better way to do it is to create a culture sem network and deploy a model for your specific culture. And then people can deploy theirs, right? And then you get a model for every different culture. And the funny thing is, you're going to get cultures you never thought of, right? Cultures that maybe not a lot of people know about. And that, that's actually where it gets really interesting. That's pretty... Okay, so you have to build that model kind of from the get-go based on the culture, not tweak sort of an existing one. You can. You can do either or. If there's an existing one, grab it, tweak it, and deploy it. If, you, if there isn't one, just build it and deploy it, right? That's going to sort of the beauty of the system. You can do anything. Got it. Okay. Because the reason I ask is because like I'm I'm sort of trying to like form a thesis or figure out like if we have a a many model world or a slim model world, and I think betting on the world converging on one thing is is probably wrong, right? We have so many cultures, so many different countries. Like I, I think it would just be weird to expect one all encompassing model to to win. It is a little tough. Yeah, it's a little tough to kind of have one all encompassing model. I think you might actually do that if you had a giant enough system with a lot of parameters and a big model. Yeah, you might. But you still will miss some cultures, right? Like, for example, um, you know, one of my best friends growing up is Chechen, right? Now, now, this culture is not really that well known unless you either live in the area or they have a large concentration in Jordan. But if I ask somebody from China who's training a model to, let's say, their model, I ask get some Chechen questions, they won't even know what the heck I'm talking about because there's a small culture and it's not really that well known within the Chinese culture itself. So it kind of goes back to the bias idea that, you know, that we talked about is that in our biases, we sort of also think about, okay, the cultures that I know are X, Y, Z. I, there's a lot of subcultures I don't know, so I'm not really going to think about them. So I'm going to train that model without that knowledge. So it's not the AI's fault. It's not even the, 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 it's not even the engineer's fault because it's just that's, what we know is what we know, right? We just work with the data that we have. Now, that is, that is a lot of sense. And like if you're an app developer creating a front-facing way for consumers to, to use BitTensor, I forgot to ask this, but what are the costs compared to building a wrapper around OpenAI and providing that same use case? Is it much cheaper? Is it more expensive? Or what's the barrier to entry for the developer and the user of these models? Um, it really it really depends, right? So to give you a, more of an example, it depends on the validator that you're building on top of. So let's say that you're just a regular developer. You don't care about the token and you don't care about anything. All you want to do is just build a website around image generation and that's it. You could totally do that just building on top of one of the validators. And I'm pretty sure one of the validators right now is is free. <laughs> you don't even need to worry about that anymore. There's actually a subnetwork that actually today had a big announcement. Um, subnetwork 18, Cortex. They can actually generate a thousand images per second. And they're all using an open AI endpoint. And there's nothing stopping somebody from building a, a front-facing entity that pings their validator. And you can get all those images for free, for example. If they decide to charge for it, that's kind of up to them. But it's really, you have more shopping more shopping versatility as opposed to, uh, you know, say OpenAI. OpenAI just gets charged their price and that's it. But the validators on BitTester can actually compete for pricing and uh, provide the better stuff. And I think that's probably the next stage we're entering next year. I, I know we're hopping all over the place, but this is helpful. There's just so much to discuss and so many rabbit holes. So the, the users are paying though in like, they would pay the front facing app like in, in USDC or something, or, or would they pay in Tau or, or how exactly would the compensation flow work? It's totally up to the user and uh, it's totally up to the validators and the users themselves, right? So so one of the pipelines that we're looking at building, and I think it's very possible somebody might be able to see this, is completely abstracting Tau away. All you have to do is just have a Stripe integration, put in your credit card, and all of that is done for you. You really, all you need to know is, okay, I paid 10 bucks, I get 10 bucks worth of usage. That's it. And that's also very possible. And that's actually one of the low hanging fruit that people can do. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say what I'm saying. <laughs> No, oh, that's awesome. Allah, I feel like we've covered so much. I mean, is, are, was there anything that we like missed thesis-wise or were there any questions that you get from anyone else out there that I sort of may have missed that were pretty thought-provoking? No, I think you kind of nailed everything. Uh, that was that was very good. And uh, 
yeah, if there's if you come up with any more, happy to kind of hop on again. Yeah, no, I mean, if anybody's listening to this building on BitTensor, you know, feel free to reach out to me. We're we're a fund and we're actively looking. So I think that was one question we discussed offline, but I'm happy to answer this for you here, just because I think it might be very relevant to everybody, especially today. You had asked me, you know, Sam got fired from Open AI. Does BitTensor really have a CEO in a few years at all? That is a definite no from our side. We have definitely started actually decentralizing the system itself. The best case scenario here is that the foundation itself eventually just becomes irrelevant to the overall project and just becomes another participant. Um, so long as the project is really dependent on us, then we're not really fully decentralized. And decentralization and commodification of AI is really our, co- our core goal above all else. Actually, in the coming year, Q1, Q2, uh, we're looking at kind of letting go of the system and creating a more formalized governance structure. So the foundation has even less power in the system. That's pretty cool. I, it's admirable, right? I mean, we've not to, you know, paint BitTensor with what we've seen in crypto, but, you know, what we've seen in crypto is a, a similar story from foundations, right? To, to eventually dissolve or to support, you know, the projects. And it's really hard for them to give up the power and control, right? It's really hard. And, you know, because some of them have just massive treasuries and, you know, some of them want to milk salaries, some of them want to, you know, promote the vision, but the vision kind of faded. So, I feel like it does get really hard, but in your case, maybe it's maybe it's a bit easier. Not sure. It, I'm not sure if it is easier. It's just more so that we are trying to not own the system, right? It kind of flies against the the ethos that we've created. Is that oh yeah, I shouldn't really be owned by anybody, and as long as we are able to uh, influence it in any way, that sort of takes away from our thoughts and ideals here. Is there any? I mean, just on that topic, is there anything? Are there any major manual levers that you'd have to decentralize? Like in crypto, it's you know classic multi-sig going to the community, something like that. But are there any like protocol level controls that you're afraid to hand back to the community or, or worried about? You kind of nailed it on the head. It's classic multi-sig being handed to the community. That's all it is. The, the reason why we still have a multi-sig uh, pseudo key is really just for chain upgrades. One of the great things about the uh, substrate SDK that we're using is it enables us to upgrade the chain on the fly without a chain fork. Um, and that means we can change the code without affecting the integrity of the chain, which is a huge deal because, you know, a decentralized AI, they're always pushing upgrades. You're always changing things. And it's such an experimental project. You always need to push releases, right? It's not just going to be like a one shot done kind of deal. And so um, we needed that capability. And that's why that key still exists. But we are um, sort of starting to reach steady state, knock on wood here. Um, but once we do, it's going to be much easier to just let go of that key and allow all of these upgrades to the chain to be determined by the community itself. And everyone can vote on it and becomes uh, much less centralized on us, ideally. That's pretty cool. Is the interplay with Polkadot limited to Substrate or is there greater interplay there? No, it's just Substrate. Um, dude, we're literally, we're just using the SDK. We're still an L1 blockchain. We're not a parachain or anything like that. Allah, I'm so happy we finally got to, to have this conversation and, and the timing is sort of impeccable given what's going on. So I really appreciate you coming on. I, I hope to have you on again soon and uh, we could do an update and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.